Welcome to another episode of Great Sound Lab. So I'm back here again with Axel Gray. And today we'd like Hello. to talk about uh, frequency response. And uh, unfortunately, it's a topic where we can't fill you in in five minutes and you are a master and know everything. But uh, we will give you like uh, piece by piece some, some information that may help you, uh, how to say, discern information on the internet a little bit better. Basically, the core of the issue for us is that every acoustic engineer uh, that I know would probably prefer an electrostatic headphone to some $100 dynamic driver headphone, even though the dynamic driver headphone may be very well tuned. There is still a lot of information in the sound that cannot be really reflected in the frequency response. And the funny thing is, some things like a larger drive or an angle, it may leave an artifact in the frequency response, so you see it in there, but it is not that this artifact then reproduces exactly that sound. That is very important to keep in mind. It's not like that um, there is no interaction at all, but to say that the whole truth is in the frequency response is uh, very much simplified down. So that is just an opening and the other factors are of course like driver angle and size I just talked about. Um, that then we have the acoustic imp impedance we love to talk about so much. Um, so that it's very very open and there's very little reflections in the ear cup. Um, and we'll also talk about that more in the future of course. THD is an important factor which also alters the sound quite a bit. Um, and then also actually the driver itself matters a lot. So and not only the size, but also um, which material it is. And um, yeah, in the end also how, how it's shaped and how it excurses and so on. So it's a lot of stuff which you only really understand if you work in detail with it. Yeah. And it's not only that. It, it's uh, we, we made some tests and these are more the psychoacoustical things, ah, yeah. but the color of the headphones influences the perceived sound. <laughs> so when it's black, it's perceived uh, more bassy, darker, not that much with heights. And when it's more silver, it's uh, yeah perceived more. Yeah, there are more heights and, and so on, but not that much of a high amount of bass. And yes, when the ears are touched, it calls more muffled. And when the ears are not touched by something, it sounds more open, things like that play a big role as well. Yep. As an addition to what you just said is uh, the electrostatics. Yes, so big diaphragm headphones, so like some electrostat planar drivers or headphones with planar drivers are like that. But so an approach to achieve something very similar is uh, the ring radiator and the HD 800 where the sound radiating area is very big as well, but with a dynamic driver. Yeah, there are many different approaches. So uh, this one is another one where the driver size itself is not that very big. It is compared to others, not small, but normal. But the sound field is radiated towards the ears and not from, from the side. So that's something different. And so bigger amount or area of the ear is used to shape the sound. And that's actually a really fun example because you can put the headphones on the right way so that the sound is radiated from the front, how it should be. And you can obviously put it on the wrong way and then it obviously sounds extremely different and also the measurement is very different. But then if you say only frequency response matters, then you could try to equalize it if you put it on the wrong way uh, to, to, to the right frequency response. And I promise you, you will never manage. It, it will always sound different. That's <laughs> yeah. So uh, there are some, some discussions going on now. And uh, Sean Olive, father of the Harman reference curve, is part of that discussion as well. And he says, yes, the curve is something very important, but it's not all. And I fully agree to Sean in, in this. So there are so many other parameters and they are not all fully described and research is going on on that. And there are some uh, different institutes, universities working on that. And I'm very proud that we are part of a project with the university in Hanover, where we are working on these parameters as well. But that is science and, and really getting um, things that we measure in uh, relation to things that we perceive. And it's not simple because everything is related with everything. And to just look at one parameter, and change that parameter and see what, what's happened then. It's, it's not that simple as one can think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess then uh, with that out of the way, which was already quite a long introduction, we'll just dive into uh, like frequency responses in general. So one thing is sort of the importance of some things you see in frequency responses. And what I have here is a frequency response of an uh, Sennheiser HG250 BT, uh, which is a product I worked on and which I think sounded fantastic. Um, it's unfortunately discontinued now. 
um, but it has a bit of a dip at roughly four kilohertz. And if you just look at the frequency response, you could get the idea of, well, it's uh, actually, it's, uh, it looks sort of balanced, but um, well, the dip is not perfect. Maybe it's not, uh, it's a bit grainy in the treble or something like that. And the reality is, especially in that frequency range, if you have just a very, very tiny trough, then it is barely audible. So it's really, really hard. And even if you're very experienced, then you need a very specific song or something to, to usually notice something like that. Um, and I guess for every normal consumer, this does not really matter that much in that specific case. So of course, the, depending on where this dip sits, it could be a bit more audible than in others. But like this four or five kilohertz region, there's very few like characteristic sounds which have their uh, like, like characteristic uh, oh. harmonics in there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so dips when they're very narrow band, yeah, are not audible. So this is my experience as well. <laughs> when you have the same peak <laughs> with the same height at the dip, uh, and it's narrow band, you will clearly hear it, yeah. and uh, so that would be annoying. But uh, dips are something, yeah, yeah. not that bad. Yeah, exactly. And usually you would destroy more by trying to equalize it out. So because in the end the, the dip um, could be located there on a measurement coupler, but on your head it could be shifted a bit, a few hundred hertz upwards or downwards. And then if you try to equalize a, a, a dip and, and put a huge peak there, then you probably make the sound a bit worse. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, equalizing is not really something that is completely bad, but when you equalize something, you should not do that in narrow bands, but uh, yes, wide bands. When there are some annoying peaks somewhere, you can do some narrow band filter on it, but do it with your ears. So listen to some things, to some uh, pink noise, for example, and you see, hear some hissing things somewhere where it should not hiss, and then take that out, locate that frequency with a parametric equalizer and yes try to make it the pink noise sound pink again. So this is the way to do it and not something, okay, I've measured it on this and that coupler and I do something and then I have the perfect uh, response because it depends on the coupler and uh, on your ear it's looking completely different when you measure it with a probe microphone and what you hear is again something uh, different. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, by, by the way, also a, a way why like passive tuning of headphones is still an important art, because um, in the end, if you just put some random transducer in a random housing and then have a completely shorty frequency response and say, oh, well, I just equalize it, like most Bluetooth headphones are made, um, <laughs> um, th then this may look very good on a coupler, but uh, um, it, it may sound very, very bad to, to quite a few people where, where it then doesn't align Perfectly. So, so if you have a headphone that is very even, even passively, that's a much better starting point for digital enhancement, if you if you will. And not only for that, um, for A and C as well. So when uh, the frequency response is even more or less, the phase response is good as well. So when it's not something like a lot of resonances and whatever, and uh, the phase response is something very, very important for the stability of the ANC. And so it's good to, uh, to know how acoustics work and do that in the proper way, the acoustic tuning. Yeah. Uh, so that's just a, br a brief excourse on li like dips and frequency response. So uh, the next one is something that unfortunately just requires a lot of experience as an acoustic engineer. So there's um, the, the case of the HD A20, which uh, on many measurements has, uh, uh, so not everyone is a fan of that headphone, that is fine. Um, and I have the feeling that it is partly because it measures a bit oddly. Um, and one thing is, which occurs on a lot of measurements is that it has a bit of a dip also at like 60 hertz or something. Um, and uh, the, the funny thing is that this has also translated then to reviews and to comments and so on. And people will say, yeah, the headphone sounds weird because in the bass there's a 60 or 70 hertz dip and that's very bad. And then there's reviewers that also take their own measurement with that dip and then they recommend to equalize it out. Um, and <laughs> the funny thing is then on ratings, uh, which is a website which does basically evaluations just on objective measurements, they have found that uh, like bass responses, they just vary so much by person that they started to just use really uh, in-ear microphones for the ba bass response on a number of individuals. Yeah, to give you an, microphones, yeah. Yeah, so, so to give you an accurate reading of the actual bass response of a headphone because they found 
normal measurement heads just don't do it justice. It's just so, so different from normal people. And if you look at the ratings measurement of the HDA20, then magically you will find that there's no dip. That's uh, <laughs> that's um, that's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Are you interested why there is a dip <laughs> in the measurements? Okay, you have a closed type headphone on a yeah hard coupler, so it's not skin and bones and so on and so on. And uh, yeah, so when there is sound pressure, this uh, pressure moves the whole thing, and there is a spring. And you have a resonance of the whole system. And uh, on this hard thing, yes, it the energy is not absorbed by anything. A little bit by the ear pads and a little bit by the headband, yes. But it's not the same on a real head because the skin absorbs much more. Uh, so the coupling to with hair and everything to something absorbing is much better. And so the dip is not really there on the real head. And so l things or r things, I uh, think... Uh, is doing a great job. Yeah, and they are. They have found a, a good way to find the right frequency response in that range. Yeah, uh, I, I also pull up a little Reddit comment here, which is also talking at length about the HD twenty, why it's maybe okay or not okay. And then one one snippet of it is uh, at the same time the eighty hertz notch will make some bass lines or kick drums less solid. And obviously that will not happen on, on a set uh, unless here is a measurement coupler. And now there's two options. So either he's never listened to it, um, and, and then he's just repeating something he's seen somewhere. Um, and, and in that case, unfortunately, it's a bit of a clown move to do that. Um, so sorry for that. Um, the other option is that maybe he listened to it, but looked at the frequency response beforehand, and then just imagined that to be there. And that is unfortunately also something that happens, that our visual perception is much, much stronger and dominant than our auditory system. So if you see a frequency response before listening to a headphone, then you're always, always influenced. And if you see there, oh, it has a lot of trouble, then it, you will hear it for sure, whether that's on your head there or not. Yeah, so as a recommendation, and I do it all of my life when I get a new headphone and I should say how it sounds or how, how it is, how the quality is. The first thing is I put it on my head and listen to it with music that I know very well and equipment that I know very well. And after that, I start everything else measuring and so on. And then from the measurements, I might understand better why I have these impressions that I hear, yeah. but not the other way around. Yeah. So very, very professional people who are really working with headphones or acoustics, speakers, whatever, can divide. So I've seen that and, and uh, because they know that they are wrong when they say, okay, I've seen that and it sounds like that. So, but uh, when you're a normal listener, it, and, and I do it, by the way, exactly the same way, listening first and then measure. Yeah. Uh, also, when doing test listening, you always get from the acoustic engineer just three samples and they tell you, what do you think? And, and then you have to listen. And then afterwards, you give them your impression and you see the frequency response measurements. And sometimes you uh, see something very different than you thought. Um, yeah, and that brings me sort of back to the purpose of frequency response measurements because they are the most popular way of evaluating headphones without listening to them, which is a bit unfortunate in my opinion. <laughs> um, but in reality, I think the main purpose of a frequency response measurement is in the hands of an acoustic engineer to evaluate whether the changes he or she makes uh, has intended quantifiable changes they intended. That's the hard truth. So. Um, in the end, it is still too simplistic to give you a full image of that. It gives you a rough overview of the balance of the sound, uh, I would say. And it can give you hints of problems. But not every little thing you see in a frequency response is a sign of bad sound. Yeah, I think uh, when creating a headphone, you need to have a yes sound that it should create in, in your mind. And then you try to... Yes, tune the headphone to sound like that. And as you said, you put it on a coupler and it doesn't matter what coupler it is. So you are coming from one frequency response that you don't like and where you think, okay, I need a little bit more here or a little bit less there. And then, then you are doing the acoustical tunings that, and you see on the coupler, it's getting in that frequency a little bit less or where you want or where you don't want and you say, no, that's the wrong frequency range. I need to go a little bit lower. So maybe longer tubes or whatever is necessary. And you get the right result in the end. And on the screen, you listen to it and say, 
yeah close but it's not that so it might be somewhere else yep. and, and this is the loop you're going listening measuring listening measuring and so on yep uh, I, I think we are done with the first part of the discussion so I promise you we'll make a few more videos on it but but the problem is the topic is just so big that we'll have probably like a five parts in the end or something and it's something where you just need to collect more and more data points so there's as I said no one formula but there's this uh, thing with the standing waves. There's uh, the idea of dips not being so, so problematic in some areas and so on. And it's very detailed and not always intuitive knowledge. So we'll just keep at it and try, try to give you the information piece by piece. And at some point, uh, may, maybe it helps you make more educated decisions when, when purchasing headphones or when you think about which headphones you want to try. So when you just want to listen to music and want to buy a headphone, try it, listen to it listen to it with music that you like and when it sounds good to you it's good trust your ears and when it's your hobby to play around with headphones doing measurements and so on we will give you the right explanations to understand better what you're doing yeah exactly so thank you so much um and have a happy new year hopefully so uh we are just before christmas here in germany and uh, we're looking forward to, to some time off but we'll be back certainly next year and uh, yeah, do the next part. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.